بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله على كل حال ونعمة الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبات للمتقين استعينه ونستحره ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه من يهدي لا فلا مدل له ومن يهدي فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إلها واحدا ونحن له مسلمون ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وبعد We begin by praising and invoking Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Seeking Him, seeking His assistance, His guidance, His forgiveness Proclaiming our belief and trust in Him Recognizing that He gives guidance And none other gives guidance And if He does not provide guidance Then again none will be guided we affirm similarly that He alone is a, is a worship subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He has sent forth prophets and messengers throughout time, and we affirm that this process has concluded with the coming of Muhammad, the seal of the prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a statement that I, that we make often in that this deen has come particularly the revelation of the Quran to the final messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is come not only to provide guidance but it has also come to provide inspiration motivation to bring joy to bring confidence to bring strength to those who have sad hearts and overwhelmed bodies or depressed bodies and what the deen does, or what the Qur'an does in particular, is that it employs a number of ways to accomplish this goal. And one of those ways we will look at today, inshallah. One of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this is He points us towards history. He points us towards things which occur in history. And I'm going to go into some small details. But before that, I want to mention that history itself is a very important subject. History itself is a very important subject. In I want to highlight that humans, and frankly, it doesn't matter if if the audience is is an audience of believers or disbelievers with the statement that humans cannot afford. We as human beings, we cannot afford to be illiterate in history, particularly scriptural political and social history. We cannot afford to be ignorant about those things, about those aspects.
And with that as an introduction, we'll go into some history as presented by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about a social order. A social order that existed in Egypt. It was a social order constructed upon facade, upon corruption, upon tyranny. Facade. And this social order was constructed upon facade to the point where the figurehead of that social order, known as Pharaoh, Fir'aun, that he proclaims himself as a god. And Rabbukum wa'alam, he said, I am your Lord. I am, I am your Lord, the most high, the highest, the most high. Part of the meaning of that is that he wanted to control all within his so-called dominion. But he proclaimed himself, he saw himself in that way. He saw himself in divine terms. And in this environment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent forth a messenger. He sent forth a messenger. He ordained, this is a better term, Allah ordained for the emergence of a messenger to eventually rescue those who are most oppressed and to call, at a minimum, to call, to invite, to give da'wah to the Pharaoh, to call him the Pharaoh himself towards reformation. And this messenger was named Musa, Sayyidina Musa, السلام, or English Moses, peace be upon him, Moses. Musa السلام, was, according to the Quran, he was raised in that society. Not only that, through some details which I don't want to get into right now, but he is raised in the home of Pharaoh. He's raised in the, in the, in the, in the, in the home or the palace of Pharaoh. And I have to skip a lot of details to get to core points. But eventually, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissions him to proclaim his message to go towards Pharaoh, to present his argument, to show that he was not a delusional person, that he is speaking truth, or uh, as we say in everyday English, speaking truth of power. So he does this, Musa instead of Moses, he does this in the court of Pharaoh himself, in the presence of the Aaron or Pharaoh in the presence of Pharaoh himself. And again, I'm, sk I'm skipping some details, but Musa said that he makes a presentation to Pharaoh. And the people, the advisors, the, the, uh, the officials around Pharaoh they recognize that you know, this guy, he has some power. And they, they, they use the word sorcerer. In the head of the Sahel Ali, they use the word sorcerer. This guy, Moses, he is 
A very knowledgeable sorcerer. This is the way they talk about him. This was their perception. And because this was their perception, they decided to make a counter move. They decided to make a counter move. There was a series of counter moves when we, when we read the account, but I'm focusing here on just one counter move. And what their counter move was, was they brought sorcerers. This is, uh, this is how Allah tells us in the Quran. That they brought sorcerers to, to, uh, uh, to confront, to embarrass, to downplay, uh, to use a, 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 a contemporary term, to cancel, to cancel Musa and to cancel the message of Musa, Moses. They wanted to cancel them. And thus a confrontation is arranged, an appointment is arranged. And the employees, the sorcerers of Pharaoh, between the sorcerers of Pharaoh and Musa. And again, I'm just putting it in, in, in some um, easy language. But essentially, you think of it as a contest. So the sorcerers, the employees, the employees of Pharaoh, they went first. They went first. And the way it is worded is that they threw. And it was something which the audience found amazing. They found it amazing. And they found it overwhelming. And the way the Quran describes it, it says, Sahra wa nasi wa sahabuhum wa ja'u bi sihrin azim. That they were terrified. This presentation, this magic trick, whatever word you want to use, that they, use, that they employ, it terrified the audience. How can Moses go against that? How can Moses go against that? The prophet Moses. How can he, what can he do to topple that? So he does. By the help and assistance and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does. And it says that he threw his staff. He threw that he threw his staff. And it eliminated. It eliminated what the what uh, what actions that had been presented by the Pharaoh's people. It eliminated it. And wiped away whatever the, they did. And of course, there are many more uh, details. But I want to make a point. The point here is the power of something called truth. This is the point. The point here, at the end, the point here is the power of something called truth. Truth. The point here is the interest of justice and the power of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which breeds the desire and, and the will, the, the Drive to do the right thing. That is real power. That is stronger than media, that is stronger than politics, that is stronger than armies. And again, not a rhetorical statement, but a, a, a statement rooted in reality. When truth is presented in the right place, in the right time, and to the right people, positive changes emerges. And I want to end the first section of the khutbah with 
a reminder of the dua of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is, and I will say, I will refer to the English before referencing the Arabic, but it is such a, it is such a, it is such, it's so relevant to this subject and indeed to the age in which we live. Allah's Messenger, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, the final Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. He's taught that we should pray to Allah to show us the truth as truth. That's not all. To show us the truth as the truth and give us the ability to follow it. And to show us the falsehood, the humanity, the ridiculous thing, to show us the reality of that. And give us the ability to abstain therefrom. And this is how we end the first section of the khutbah. So in this first section of this khutbah, we have looked at Musa, Moses, alayhi salam. And perhaps we will continue to look at them. But I want to move on to Muhammad, the final Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We should know his biography, his history. Before the Nabuwa and after the Nabuwa. He went through both before the Nabuwa and after the Nabuwa, Prophet. He went through so many challenges, so many heartaches, so many hardships. He went through so many of them. And I think generally we know the details of that. Because in the past, some of those details have been shared from this very member. One thing that happened, and again I'm summarizing, is that in a fluctuating state of cold and hot war, it was at such a moment that the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Muslimin, they decided to go for pilgrimage. They decided to go for pilgrimage. And, and Makkah was under enemy control. And that moment they decided to go for pilgrimage. And again, I have to skip over some details, but they did not make the pilgrimage that time. They didn't make the pilgrimage. They didn't make it to the pilgrimage. But a treaty was made, which is called the Treaty of, of, of Hudaybiyah, a treaty. Now this treaty was not in favor of Muslims. And let me give a couple of, of a guys of time. Let me give a couple of quick examples. The formatting of the treaty itself, that the Prophet Sallallahu is to put his name and the the representative of the, of the Bankans, he objected to that. He objected to that. And what ended up happening is the Prophet, as a wise man, he had his title removed from Muhammad Rasulullah to Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And among other, this is maybe a minor thing, but more important examples 
is that the treaty was not, again, not in favor of Muslims. The treaty made it, for example, if anyone from Medina defected to Mecca, then the Meccans kept it. But if the opposite happened, if a Meccan defected to Medina and accepted to Islam, then under the treaty, the Prophet would be obligated to return the defector back to Mecca and face certain deaths. So they, there, were, there were provisions uh, like that. And you would think, uh, as anyone who's observing politics, observing how things go, a person may think that this is the end of this man Muhammad and his mission. People may come to think that, that this is an embarrassment of a treaty, an embarrassment of a treaty. But what it did is it created a certain level of stability that allowed the Prophet and the Muslims it allowed them to engage in da'wah. It allowed them to engage in, in coalition building, using modern language, in coalition building. Till eventually Mecca was liberated. And see the wisdom of the words of Allah. In the, in the fatahna la fatahna la fatahna and so the Mecca itself was liberated. And it was liberated bloodlessly. It was liberated bloodlessly. And so we learned, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal kid. We learned, Hasbi Allah wa la ilaha illa hu alayhi tawakaltu huwa rabbu Allah These are the things we learned. That we are, Allah is sufficient for us and He is the best of, of, uh, of, of representatives. That Allah is sufficient for me, I'm giving translation to the second text. Allah is sufficient for me, where the Muslims are told to say this, the Prophet and the Muslims are told to say this. Allah is sufficient for me, none of us is worship except Him. Upon him I place my trust, he is the Lord, and he is the Lord of the magnificent throne. What is the point? What are the lessons? Is that the lessons are if we have the faith of Musa salam, the faith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, having dependence ultimately, ultimately upon whom? Upon Allah. Upon the Lord of the universe, Allah, who is the one who commands justice, Allah, the one who commands fair play. If we have dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if we adorn ourselves with attributes such as the attribute of truth and the attribute of justice, and speak and act with wisdom, with intelligence, not emotionally, but with wisdom and intelligence, with facts, with truth, then certainly a better world emerges. And we have evidence for that from the two prophets that we have talked about. Peace be upon them. And what is beautiful and what is relevant from these two, the Prophet Moses and the Prophet Muhammad what is beautiful and important is the lesson of looking at long-term goals. Long-term goals, long-term aspirations, and avoiding the pitfalls of short-term benefit. This statement is not simply a religious statement. This statement has worldly, personal, 
applications. Islam itself is a religion, is a deen, excuse me, I want to stick to the word deen. Islam is a deen whose entire premise is that we do actions in this life that brings forth benefit in the life to come. It's just that we go to work. We go to work because we expect at the end of a certain period, we expect to get paid. So that's what Islam is. Islam is telling us to work here. Islam is, is the, that's, the way, that's the premise of Islam. That we do actions in this world ex expecting a paycheck in the Akhira. This is, this is, this is what we're, this is the entire premise of Islam. So, we conclude with the statement to have faith, to have dependence upon Allah, and keep to your prayers and your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lastly, one of our community members has asked that a dua be made for his son who was uh, affected by a fire. And it is the, the brother's name is Ibrahim. Uh, he has asked us to make dua that he be healed. But I don't want to make dua just for him. I want to make dua for all of our brothers and all of our sisters and all of our parents and all of our children who have been afflicted everywhere in this world. Allahumma hamd shuhada al-Muslimin. Allahumma izz al-Islam al-Muslimin. Fi kulli makan. Fi rahmatika ya arham al-Rahimin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi al-akhirati hasana. Wa qina azab al-nar. Rabbana la taj'alna ma'al qawm al-zalimin. Rabbana amanna fawfir lana rahamna wa anta khayr rahimin. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من دونك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخفم عاد سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين رب العالمين وعقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا معروفا. Thank <laughs> you.